I'm Kerry Stinson, and my journey through life has been quite an adventure. For over 20 years, I played Barney the Dinosaur on tour and seven seasons of the hugely popular TV show, Barney and Friends. Now my journey is to bring together friends and guests from all over the entertainment world for inspiring and at times amusing behind the scenes conversation. I'm Kerry Stinson, and this is Purple Roads. Welcome to another Purple Roads. I am so excited you're here. We've got such a special guest today. I am so excited to get into this wonderful oh. conversation. I, I real quickly want to thank our sponsor, Infusion HF70 Plus, for sponsoring and being with us here on Purple Roads. So without taking any more break, I'm so excited I can't stand it. We have oh. Francois Clemens here today from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. How are you, Francois? Well, I am just fine. Uh, it's getting warmer up here. I love spring when the flowers show you. At least they, they turn green. So I love it up here in Vermont. Uh, I've been able to go outside and walk now. The snow is all gone. <laughs> and, you know, I'm not one of those guys who go skiing and uh, cross country and climbing rocks and all that stuff. So I like it when it's the regular uh, sidewalk you can walk. And uh, I love it up here. I have lots of friends. I just am sorry everybody left, so I'm all alone, practically, <laughs> well, except for my neighbors, you know? Well, I'm, you're here with me today, and I'm so excited about <laughs> that. So I, I want to get, there's so much to talk about with you. Um, I want to get into a little bit before Mr. Rogers. What were you doing before him? What was your career leading into your days with Mr. Rogers? Well, you have to remember, I was pretty young. Uh, when I met Mr. Rogers, I was 24. Okay. So I was still in college. I went to Oberlin, then I went to um, grad school. And my I met him during my first year of grad school. So in my opinion, I was working on a career. I certainly had a, shown that I could sing right. opera by winning a couple of con contests. I've been encouraged uh, by members of my uh, uh, school committee at, at college. Uh, I sung with several choirs. So singing was something that I, I did from the, probably the time I came out of my mother's womb, I always say. <laughs> uh, I, you know what I mean? Because I've never not sung. So uh, my great-grandmother sang, my grandmother sang, and my mother definitely sang. And I used to imitate them when I was uh, a child around the house, uh, if they were sweeping or mopping or ironing, whatever duties they were doing, washing dishes or washing, I imitated them and I sang. So it came, became very, very natural for me. And I was encouraged by my aunts and uncles and cousins by the dozens. <laughs> and uh, When did and, you get uh, into and, singing opera? Well, that's the irony of it. I've always sung opera because I used to imitate Mario Lanza, you know, those uh, great <clears throat> tenors that you hear on. I was the telephone hour and uh, a couple of television programs uh, where I heard and a, a social worker heard me sing uh, when I was like in 10th grade, I think. And she said, do you want to study and really do something with your voice? And I said, yes, of course, I'd love to. And it was a little back and forth there because I also wanted to play the uh, piano. Okay. And I was I could read music, but I couldn't uh, really deliver. So. She and my mother put their heads together, and they decided that I should study voice. So I've been singing opera since then. I started out listening to UC Burling, you know, the great Italian uh, uh, singers, a great of Italian opera. He was not Italian. And, uh, Mar uh, of course, the great Caruso. Uh, I simply loved that sound, and I could reproduce it without, uh, it, it was not effortful. I just opened my mouth. And I started singing, and that's what came out. I started singing um, uh, some of the lyric tenor uh, parts from the opera, uh -huh. uh, from uh, La Traviata, uh, from Elixir of Love. There were certain ones that just seemed to be perfect for my young voice. And I'm very happy I had the teacher that I had, because he was a tenor also, so he could hear in my voice what was in his voice. And uh, he encouraged me to continue to work on this repertoire. I loved it right from the beginning. So um, I sang parts of Carmen, which was a little heavy for me. I never did it with orchestra, and I wouldn't do it with orchestra. But as a young person learning to sing in French and um, 
with an accompaniment, uh -huh. I did very well. In fact, a lot of the repertoire I could do very well with a piano or only with orchestra in concert. I did not have a, uh, an extensive stage career in opera, maybe about 12, 13 years. And then my career moved steadily towards art songs and American Negro spirituals. It seems I had a real uh, gift for uh, the drama, the dramatic on stage, you know, one person expressing one feeling or whatever, one character in a song, and then another song, and another song. I loved doing that. And my teacher encouraged me because it seems as, uh, as though I showed up. Right. Maybe I can use that phrase. Sure. When I was singing a song, something uh, happened, she said to me, that was pretty interesting and pretty decent. So she really, really encouraged me to follow this um, this uh, leading that I like to sing song literature. The other thing is I, I love the poetry. It's really uh, many times Langston Hughes or some of the uh, romantic, you know, poets, Keats, Shelley. I love uh, that it's frequently high class poetry. Um, I guess the other thing was in our country, <clears throat> a black tenor, I'm a lyric tenor. Okay. And a black tenor has a lot of problems in the opera houses because we still have a lot of racism, a lot of prejudice. And so people didn't necessarily want to hire me to do a romantic lead opposite a lovely white soprano or alto mezzo soprano. And it was silly because the singers never felt that way. And I've never heard an audience member say that. But there were producers, directors, and what have you, who simply did not give me an audition. And they did what we call in the business type casting, which I think is something that should be go along with it. Electoral college and be done with it. What what because, time in uh, what time in the country was that? When was this happening? Well, nineteen sixty-five. Okay, sixty-four. Uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was very very active in our civil rights struggle in America, and so was I. It was very important to me. There were so many fronts in which issues concerning lynching of black men uh, and killing of uh, black children in churches. There were four of them shot down there in Jackson, Mississippi. Mm -hmm. And not to mention, you know, the assassination of our beloved John Kennedy. Oh, my goodness. And then Robert Kennedy. And then Martin Luther King Jr. So it was during the, the height of the civil rights struggle. There were also um, riots. Lord have mercy. Everywhere. Uh, when Dr. King was killed, I think every major inner city in America had a full-fledged riot. And uh, that was not something I'm proud of, but it's a fact. Sure. And that's the era in which right. I grew up in. And then that's <clears throat> about the time you met Fred Rogers? I had met him already. Okay. But it's, it's one of those ironies of life that um, when Dr. King was murdered in uh, Memphis, I was, at, I was at my home in Pittsburgh. And uh, suddenly my, the doorbell rang. I had no idea who it was. And it was Fred Rogers and the organist at the church. I had a church job at Third Presbyterian Church. Uh, I was the tenor soloist. And his, the organist was John Lively. He was the one who hired me. And he was the one who introduced me to Fred Rogers. So I'll always be grateful to my friendship and musical relationship with John Lively. Well, there was Fred standing at the door saying, Get your luggage. Uh, you're coming with me. I had barely met him about three months or four months before. So you can understand how uh, it was out of, um, uh, uh, you know, I thought, well, what is this? What Out of character. Right. For him to be such a caring, I didn't know him as mm -hmm. well as I do now. Sure. Or, or I knew him years later. Sure. When his caring nature was so real and was so uh, enveloping, embracing, because the way he said that to me, I thought, he means for me to get my luggage <laughs> and, get, and follow him. And, you know, because my inclination was, well, why should I? I live here. Right. I'm at home. Well, I lived about four or five blocks from this part of they call it the Hill District in okay. Pittsburgh. Sure. And, I mean, you could see the smoke. If you went outside of my house and went upstairs to the r roof, uh -huh. you could look down there and you could see the smoke uh, where they were burning buildings and businesses it was very, very sad because, you know, 
know, and stuff like that happens that touches all of us. But sure. it's, it's almost like what I call a kind of political suicide. You're striking out at your own family, your own businesses, moms and pops who has struggled and worked very hard. You know, sometimes they have a little bodega or a little flower shop or a little, uh, you know, uh, shoe repair cleaners to go to in the community. They had right. stayed in that community. And here they were, everybody was suffering when Dr. King was assassinated, but burning the buildings because you were angry to me was made no sense whatsoever. So he comes in and gets you to, so did you pack your bags and go? Oh, I certainly did. I packed them <laughs> and I stayed with him for about three weeks. Wow. Uh, because there was lots of activity that night. You could hear gunshots going off. Uh, I don't think I realized how serious the danger was. Being new, I had never been in uh, a situation like that in my life. And so it was very threatening. But at the same time, I was a little naive because we read about it in the newspaper. And they had tanks going up and down the street of the Hill District and uh, the police were there arresting people and putting the fire department. It was a major community event. I'll call it that. And then after that, they had to have a whole series of uh, uh, discussions and civil rights issues with, you know, the NAACP. Sure. Some of the local ministers got involved. I remember Dr. Um, Green was his last name. He was one of the uh, black ministers who had gone to the same seminary. Where Fred uh, had gone, and they were they were friends. They knew each other. Well, this Dr. Green took a leadership role in helping the community to get reconciled, because when you have situations like that, a lot of the problems that were festering come out into the open, and there were issues of pol police brutality at that time, and uh, issues of a certain kind of segregation. Uh, there was redlining being done by the uh, the real estate people. In fact, that's how I had my apartment in that area. It's called uh, Shenley Heights in Pittsburgh. Okay. And um, I couldn't get an apartment down close to Carnegie Mellon. Every time I went, I look in the, the, the newspaper or the college paper for a place to live, I'd get into the house and they'd tell me that the apartment was rented. And that happened about 10 or 12 times. And I was staying with my Oberlin College roommate. His, his mother and dad lived in Penn Hills outside of Pittsburgh, not far at all. And they said, come stay with us while you look for a place to live. So Dar his name was Daryl, and I stayed at Daryl's house. And I, in the, the next day, I would drive into the city and, you know, start looking around. I did not right. know Pittsburgh as a city. And to make a long story short, uh, his mother says to me, Francois, how long have you been looking for this apartment? Two or three days? And I said, yes. She said, well, have you tried the black newspaper? And I was kind of stunned. I said, I said, no. Why should I? And she said, come with me. And I, she literally took me by the hand. And we got in the car. We drove to a certain area, uh, Oakland in, in Pittsburgh. We got the black newspaper called the Pittsburgh Courier. And we brought it home. And we sat down. And it went through the same process. And I'll be damned, but the first place I went looking for an apartment, they rented it to me. And then we had one of those real soulful conversations about how real life is mm -hmm. and the issues that a black man like myself will have to deal with. I'm going to Carnegie Mellon University, in fact, on a full scholarship but I couldn't live in the neighborhood because the real estate agents discriminated against black people. With all that going on, because mm -hmm. I know when you got in with Mr. Rogers, was it his idea to make you a police officer? Mm. I think that's a fascinating story. It's a, a totally his idea. Uh, it made me very, very, very unhappy. It shocked me mm -hmm. when he first uh, mentioned and brought the subject up because I had such a different idea of what policemen did because of the reality of what I grew up like in Youngstown, Ohio, in the ghetto. Sure. And they were very abusive. They took advantage. 
Uh, there are a lot of things that, if you want the details, they're in my book. You know, I just uh, finished a memoir that's going to be published on May 5th. Uh, I'll be down in New York in case anybody wants to come down and see Well, we definitely anyway, want them to come see you, and we will put the links to it. We will put, we will help you get that book out. Oh, I, I want to read it. Much. I think that'll be fascinating. Oh. Thank you. Anyway, I talk about that in the book. I try to give a little bit more insight mm -hmm. into uh, what kind of a uh, position I felt I had been placed in. But this is a great opportunity to be uh, to have this opportunity to learn so much. Uh, around this man who was proving to be a real shaker, you know, in, in the Pittsburgh scene. Everybody knew him. Uh, they didn't know about the program yet because it was so new, brand new. But they knew about Fred and uh, knew about some of his ideas. He had spoken to some friends and some people at the Pittsburgh Theological Seminary. So um, I tried to share with him what a uh, profoundly repugnant idea it was for me <laughs> to put on a policeman's uniform. And I, I just didn't see myself making that kind of an adjustment. I felt that if I was very happy. I could sing on his show. I said, well, come on. I am a singer, and uh, I have a master's, a, a bachelor's degree. I'm going to get a master's. Why can't I be Professor Clemens or something like that? Right. Uh, an architect or a a manager of some business or other. I don't know. I named a bunch of things that I thought were what I call respectable. Sure. And uh, he started talking to me about helpers. I'll never forget how that word really uh, made an impact, helpers. And he said, you know, when young children are lost or when they're separated from their parents or they're hurt, the first thing they do is look around for somebody, you know, they're, they're helpless to help them. And he said, I tend to think of policemen as a helper. And he said, you know, there are probably lots and lots of people in America, particularly black people, who think like you do. But maybe we could show them another humane side of the policeman and show the policeman doing things in the community that are positive, like everybody else. Well, he continued to talk, and he made quite an impression on me, and I, I like to feel like I'm a helper. That's my personality. So when he mentioned that, he got my attention. And we talked about it. It was a very, uh, I'd say maybe a couple of months, we had these intense conversations about what kind of a role I would be doing on his program. First of all, I was very happy. He asked me to be a regular uh, the value of being on that program on a regular basis cannot be measured because there I was 24 years old living in uh, Pittsburgh and there were no black actors who appeared regularly on children's television. And I began to get a perspective of what show business was like and the, the mountain that I had to climb and other black actors and actresses had to climb so that uh, <laughs> to have the opportunity to come on that program as often as it turns out was a great, great, great honor, distinction, uh, impetus to my career. I would say it probably made my career. I built a lot of things around it, but for me, it was a focal. Unlike some of the other characters of my favorite, Betty Aberlon and Mr. Feely, mm -hmm. they were there all the time. Right. And my, my way of thinking, that was a full-time job open to them but I don't think that option was open to me. And so I went on to New York, and when I said, announced that I was going to New York, I said, but you'll come back and visit, won't you? <laughs> oh, I said, you want me to come back? <laughs> I thought he was going to say, I'm through with you. <laughs> and he said, oh, no, we want you to come back. And he said, we sat down, and once again, we had these discussions which helped me to gain a deeper, richer feeling about this friendship, that it wasn't just about doing a job and about money. He was interested in me, Francois Clemens, as a human being on many different levels. As you know, there are other sure. subjects that will be discussed that we um, also were discussing. So uh, I thought, well, you know, this man, he's not rash. He's not uh, trying to force me. His logic is um, very powerful. 
Very powerful. Uh, what, uh, I, I, I'm sorry. I, I was just going to say on, on that subject. So had you ever done anything with children before, with, with children's TV or, or educating children? Was this a new experience for you? It was an entirely new experience because I had won the Metropolitan Opera auditions in Pittsburgh, and I saw myself on the operatic stage. Well, there are certainly operas done for children, and Leonard Bernstein, the great conductor of the New York Philharmonic, was, was making quite a reputation for himself doing children's concerts. So, of course, I understood the importance. Uh, there were uh, certain composers who wrote works just for children. I had learned a couple of them. Uh, Minotti is a mall in the night visitors. You know what I'm saying? Yes, There's a yes. lot of uh, uh, material which opera and concert con composers put together for children. But I didn't necessarily see myself in that role. I'm a romantic tenor. I sing Mozart. I sing young Verdi heroes and some of the other lighter repertoire, Rossini, Donizetti. And so I thought that's what I was going to be doing. I had no idea what I was there for. <laughs> it was ver a very naive decision on my part. Anyway, to make a long story short, what I found fascinating was uh, David Newell was there the whole time. And they, they played Mr. McFeely. Yes, Mr. McFeely. He was a rock, and he was so helpful to everybody. Well, he certainly was to me. And he was like a big brother. Uh, he's about 10 years older than I am. And uh, from the moment I came into the studio and met the producers and the other people who contributed, there was David. And um, I give him credit for helping to smooth the way. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes uh, it was kind of difficult because being on the operatic stage is not the same as being on the, uh, in the studio. Mm -hmm. I had to learn a whole different technique, <laughs> a way of singing. Uh, in fact, the, the, what, what was really different is that it was so intimate. It took me a long time to become accustomed to being so intimate in public. I was used to being intimate in my personal relationships, but as a uh, performer, singer, reaching out to young children watching the program, I was not accustomed to that kind of sweet innocence and caring. And I watched Fred. Believe me, I watched him like a hawk. <laughs> and so I did. So one day I asked him, what was he doing? What was he thinking? And uh, once again, as, as he, he was so generous, he spent a lot of hours explaining to me how he felt about his ministry. And uh, the fact that the distance between him and that camera was a sacred space. I never heard anything like that before. <laughs> what do you mean, sacred space? And he took the time to explain this to me. This was his calling. This was his anointment. And so he took it very seriously. When he got there in front of the camera and was talking to those kids, there was a transformative quality to him. And many, many, many people who finally got a chance to watch him and watch him work were totally tr uh, convinced of this something about this man. <laughs> because he was not a, a lively personality, you know. Uh -huh. He was very dull, as a matter of fact. <laughs> No, the the opposite boring. of you. <laughs> he wasn't like me at all. I'm the extrovert. He's the introvert. In fact, we are a perfect marriage. I used to tell people our relationship was made in heaven because from the day I met him, I never stopped talking and he never stopped listening. And that was just fine with me. And uh, it was a joke, but it was true. Uh, he just had infinite patience. Um... Uh, you know, I, I don't want to get all soppy here on you, sure. but uh, I had never had anybody take the time, uh, the patience to get to know me, what I consider an adult, getting to know a young person, and then offering suggestions about my life, uh, ideas that he thought would be positive, uh, how I felt about certain things. Nobody cared many times uh, from where I came from. They didn't care. Certainly didn't care at school. Uh, by that, I mean high school and grade school. Mm -hmm. uh, they, were, they were very, very segregated inside the building. Outside, it looked like a normal neighborhood. But once you got inside, black kids went one way, Jewish kids was gonna, went another way, and white kids, or the white Anglo-Saxon Protestants, if you want to call that, they went another way. Sometimes there was some mixture, but not very often. 
So there I was finally in Pittsburgh, and uh, and I was asking the big questions. You know, who am I? What is this civil rights stuff? What are black people doing in America? And what's our history about it? Something I had awakened inside of me. Right. And I was finally living in a big city where I could ask certain people. I could research at a, a big Carnegie Library. The University of Pittsburgh was just as important to me as Carnegie Mellon, which is where I was in school. And then I had references like Fred Rogers who would listen and, in my opinion, give me very, very thoughtful answers to the kinds of questions that I was asking about growing up, going through puberty, uh, dealing with some of the racial issues that I know he never had to deal with. Right. But I had to deal with them very, very often. You know, we, we talked about those things very openly. Uh, and there were times we were in the studio. I was there to work. And uh, he and I, he would come over or something. And he and I would walk a little bit away from the rest of the cast or the lighting guys. They were super guys. I loved working with them. But sometimes their silliness got on my nerves. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm a very serious guy because I, I have a different background. And I know poverty and lack in a way that they don't. They were all white. Sure. And I was black. So there were very different roads that we had traveled, but I adored them, and they adored me, and I love them. But that silly stuff, I didn't, I didn't want any parts of it. So I was talking with Fred about some of these things that were bother was bothering me. Uh -huh. And in the process, I discovered that he uh, was going to uh, the Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, and he, uh, he was very good at explaining some of the things and questions that I had about the Bible. Uh, I'm not a traditional Christian. I do not want people to misunderstand. I'm not an atheist. And the best thing I would say is that I'm a Unitarian Universalist. And I believe that God is everywhere, in everything, loves everybody. <laughs> uh, it's unconditional love. And that's been my motivation. Uh, as a matter of fact, Fred was the one who uh, awakened that spirit inside of me by his relationship to me. He was so generous, uh, tirelessly kind and loving. I can't think of any other way to characterize it. And I, I was getting the real thing, and I appreciated that. This was not a frivolous man. And there I was in the inner circle. I just asked myself, what did you do? <laughs> who are you? No, I'm serious. A little black guy from the ghetto, no money, wrong blood, I didn't have the lineage, um, on and on, but there I was. So, so I, I, I want to talk about the unconditional love, because, you know, I learned that through Barney for 20 years that I was on that show, and the importance mm -hmm. of unconditional love and the importance for children to understand that, it, it obviously has yes. affected your whole life. Yes, it affected my entire, still does. And, uh, and, and mine too. Spouse, a, a pardon? I said, and mine too. I, learning that yes. because I didn't, I didn't grow, I, I didn't understand that either. And, and I learned it through that wonderful purple dinosaur, and the importance of unconditional love. What have you found um, f from what you did on that show, teaching unconditional love to the children? Well, the first thing I find is that the children are not so judgmental. It's their parents or some cousins or some uh, other authority figures. Children give this unconditional love all the time. It is, I think, it's a natural part of all of us when we're born. Yes. But then we're born in certain houses and societies and uh, cultures, and they require that we behave in a certain way. If you not be, if you don't behave a certain way, you're not worthy of being loved. Well, Fred said that's a hogwash, <laughs> and help me to understand that God's love is always available to everyone, including Francois. <laughs> and that was a very important step. You know, I, I had never had, I write about it in my, uh, my uh, autobiography because it was so profound to me to have this, he was a white man who had money and status and intelligence and sensitivity, you know, every, all the good things of life. And there I was struggling, wondering if I had a right to be here, wondering why was I here? And he, he, he embraced me as a surrogate father, and he never, ever let go. He, uh, we talked about everything, everything you could imagine, because 
I, as you know, I'm an extrovert. Right. <laughs> you learned that already. Sure. I know. Yeah, yeah. I never, I never shut up. Well, when we, when I, we, when we called you and got your voice <laughs> message of you singing, it's one of my, yeah. you put a smile on everyone's face. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, you know, I started that as a kind of fun thing, and here I'm in Middlebury at at the college. Uh. So many of my students asked me to do <laughs> what I do their uh, answering <laughs> machine, and I was a little shocked at first. But it's become a, a thing that I do uh, at our church. We had an auction. I raised several thousand dollars. It oh, surprises that's, me. That's wonderful. And people, I just improvise it. Everything I, when I do, though, I just start singing, and I don't shut up until I say, okay, that's, the tape has run out. <laughs> There's no more room. Shut up. Love it. So <laughs> I, uh, I like spontaneity, fun things like that. So I've done about 40 or 50 of my I call them my cosmic children. Yeah. Uh, uh, they've asked me to do their sound machine, and I like I like doing that. Oh, it's wonderful. How, so I want to ask you, when did you realize the effect, the positive effect you were having on children for being on that, that show? I, I watched you as a kid, and you brought a lot of joy to my life. When, when did you realize what the effect you were having to children? Well... Uh, I, I don't know quite why uh, it happened this way or why Fred did it, but I did four shows in the beginning, I guess. You know, that 1968, okay. uh, they were filming. It's still in black and white. And uh, during over the summer, he got in touch with me and let me know he wanted me to do some more. And I thought, you want me to do more? <laughs> and he said, yes. He had already gotten positive feedback from my presence on the show. I said, well, all I did was sing a couple of spirituals. And he said, something transformative, Francois, happens when you sing. <laughs> and people are moved, very deeply touched, even if it's just saying you have a beautiful voice. But uh, he convinced me to continue to follow in that direction. And so I said, well, I'll come back for some more and uh, see what else I have uh, to offer. Then I began to realize that the children who were writing these notes and sending them in to Fred were black and white and, and uh, Spanish and uh, Asian. They were everything. Right. I thought, my goodness, you know, this program is going all over the country. And uh, that's when I woke up and I began to realize that I was bringing something to the program. I had no idea. I did not intend to. <laughs> <laughs> I just showed up. I was the right person, the right chemistry. Because a lot of times I think that's what happens, that you have something to do in this life, and we find we have different ways of getting there. And I write about it because it was such a unique experience for me to feel that I have a partnership with Fred Rogers. He and I did many, many, many things together. As Fred, he had other partners with Lady Aberlin, sure. with Mr. McFeely. I consider us his cosmic children. <laughs> and... Really, I do, that we were drawn there uh, because there was something needed to complete the experience of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. And uh, what I realized is that he had no real understanding of poor people. Uh, he really did not. He said to me, what does it feel like, Francois, to go to bed hungry at night? Well, I thought, he doesn't know what that feels like? What kind of guy is he? In the ghetto, we all know what it feels like to be hungry and to go to bed hungry and wake up the next morning hungry. You know how we're having this episode in our society now. Right. And the, one of the things they're concerned about is that if there's no school, where do the kids eat? Right. This is a serious issue. Absolutely. You cannot, in my opinion, teach a hungry child. You must feed them first. So uh, I, I told him what it felt like. I shared it as much as I really could. He was a very empathetic person. So he was ready to learn. He was not haughty. He was not proud. He was not falsely, you know, built himself up because he became my student. Right. On these issues of the ghetto. How could he possibly know what I knew? So. So were you surprised were things, that he wanted to listen, that he wanted to learn? He, very, he was hungry. He was as hungry to learn about me and what, what my parents had been like because I was a traumatized kid. Uh, my parents fought physically. Mm. 
it was the worst nightmare you could ever imagine. And I didn't go into therapy about it until I was about, well, 24, 25. Fred was one of the ones who said, maybe you should go into therapy, Francois. It was like I had this bleeding uh, uh, gash in my back that was constantly uh, allowing the vital me to escape. And he said, there are issues that you've had as a child that you have not resolved. You should sit down and talk to someone professional about I said, what? Every, well, I grew up, if you went to, the, uh, to a psychiatrist, it's because you were crazy. But uh, he gave me a very, very different perspective on how you work to heal. And part of it is being aware of what's causing the anger, what's causing the pain. There were, there were deep adult attitudes. So that, I, when I used to speak with him uh, about these issues, he and I would, you know, pull ourselves away so that we could have a very deep conversation about things like uh, washing Peter's feet, the other the disciples' feet, in that little pool of water. Right. And uh, uh, the prodigal son. We talked about the prodigal son a lot. We also talked about um, my anointment. I have an anointment also. And he was the one who said to me, you know, you're a minister too. I said, well, I'm not going to seminary. <laughs> I've had enough of school. And uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, that kind of um, commitment and involvement meant going up into the pulpit and preaching a sermon, which I had, didn't want any parts of that either. Now, I don't mind lecturing like you hear me now. I'm right. pointing into my soliloquy here. Sure. And I, can... <laughs> oh, I love it. I, don't... <laughs> I love it. I find it fascinating. <laughs> but I don't, um, I, don't, I, I don't see myself as a preacher. What I did that day, by the way, was I really met him on Good Friday. I did a concert at Third Presbyterian Church with the organist okay. where I sang and he never said a mumbling word, <laughs> not a word, not a word. And he never said a mumbling word. So we did all of the stations of the cross, you call them. Mm -hmm. And the preacher would speak uh, a, a phrase or a couple of verses from the Bible. And then I would sing something comparable uh, to those we, and we chose the passages. Ah, uh, well, oh, tell me where to find him. It's about the, you know, when he's escaped, they feel from the tomb. And they come and the tomb is empty. Uh, I consider that a very deep personal experience. And uh, so the spirituals, are expressing also the loneliness, the deep sense of abandonment of the slave and of my people. So I have a sense of this loss, of this deep longing, and something that uh, was very important and central to you is suddenly gone. And were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Oh, 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 sometimes it causes me to tremble, tremble, tremble. Were you there, oh Lord? When they crucified my Lord. You, you're bringing a tear to my eye, Francois. It's just so beautiful. Thank you. That's what I did that day. And it meant that, that it meant a lot to me. And so when it was finished, he came up to me and he said, Francois. Oh, they introduced us, of course. Mm -hmm. Yes. 
He said, I've never been so touched by a Good Friday service like this. Where did you get this idea? I said, oh, I've been thinking about it for a while. Uh, I knew the spirituals, and I, I knew that it would just take the right uh, church and building, the uh, right support, in order to present it. And because as soon as I presented the idea to the organist, my goodness, he thought it was the greatest idea <laughs> since sliced bread, as they say. So um, he and I decided to do that. I have done it now about 25, 30 times, and it's a wonderful, wonderful experience for me personally because it reflects my own spiritual love for divinity. It's one way that I can do. So when did you realize the importance of music for children? I think it, you know, Barney was a lot about music, and mm -hmm. obviously you did that a lot. When did you realize that you, children respond to it so much? I'm sorry. I used to see you dancing around. That's what I was <laughs> I liked it. Uh, I, I didn't realize how much effect it had on children until at least the second or third year. Fred began to invite me to come with him when he went to daycare centers. Okay. Uh, in uh, Pittsburgh, there was one that he went to. I think every week. So he invited me to come there with him, and I got involved with uh, presenting music, and we, we developed Clemens' the studio out of that experience. And we brought the experience into the studio, set it up, and that was really the, one of the moments when I felt most happy <laughs> because I was not really Officer Clemens. I was a musician, Professor Clemens. And uh, I eventually played many different roles, especially in the operas, you know. Uh, he gave me a chance to do a lot of good singing and i enjoyed it immensely and then i did um uh i did let's see philip the photographer fill up your camera fill up fill up your camera with film he did some songs for me like that because uh, i want I, you know i had a different younger personality sure. i wanted to do something and that's how he tapped into it i thought it was it was just wonderful to uh, to feel like I was a, becoming a kind of free spirit and the things that I wanted to try, I wanted to experiment. I sang all the stuff from Porgy and Bess. There's a boat that's leaving soon for New York. Come with me. And I did that on the show. I did Summertime, which is not, but not sport and life music, right. but I can sing anything. So I did all of that. Uh, I had a chance to experiment. He knew uh, uh, and appreciated many jazz musicians, uh, and so he had them on the program. And sometimes he would invite me to come, and other times I was not a part of it. But uh, I, I was, and sometimes he would say, "You're not working, but come to the studio, Francois. Uh, come so that you can be around us." Uh, I can't tell you how what a wonderful shock that was to me when he said, you know, come to Pittsburgh. I said, Fred, but I'm not going to be filming. He says, you don't have to be filming to come to, be, to Pittsburgh. You want to be with us? Come on. I'm curious, what now, did the children think of, of you singing opera? You know what I had? I had gotten a lot of um, co correspondence sure. where the children told me that's where they began to love opera, hearing me sing it. And two things, opera singer and a policeman. I said, What? So I get the letters. I, I get them fairly often now. You know, since um, Morgan Neville made the great, great documentary, yes. I Want You to Be My Neighbor. I saw I it. I really, really loved working with him. He was so sensitive. And he was so, uh, you know, well, here we go again. I had had two strokes. And I honestly didn't think I was going to be able to do it. Because the first time he called, he said, we're out here in Los Angeles and Hollywood. Can you fly out here and film? And I said, no. <laughs> uh, he said, oh, we're so sorry. We want to work with you. And uh, he said, can we call you back? I said, yeah, call me in a couple of weeks and see how I feel better. And I had a second stroke. Oh. Are you ready? <laughs> what is this? You know. So to make a long story short, he said, we're in Pittsburgh. Can you come here? I said, no, I can't. Finally, he said, how about if we drive up to Vermont and uh, can we film it in your home? I thought, well, okay, I can throw something on out here. I can get dressed, <laughs> and I can, uh, yeah, come come here to my home. So that's what they did. They uh, took this big old rental truck, you know, right? And uh, 
they uh, they put all their stuff on the front porch. I had this wonderful front porch that I had built onto this home. And uh, then they, they came in and moved all of my furniture. I didn't care, really. But it was just interesting to see all this going on around me. So they moved it all until it was in a place where they liked it and felt the lighting was, you know, okay, the sound was this. And then they started filming. And I just simply have to say, again, I have nothing but admiration and praise for Morris Morgan Neville, who I think was not only very sensitive to us, the actors and actresses who had worked on the program, but to the material. He had the right touch. And he was basically telling me that it was because of his children that he decided to pay attention. What are my children watching? What's going on here? So he began to pay attention. And watching it from their perspective, he knew about the show, but watching it from their perspective gave him a different perspective and understanding of what Fred was doing. And that, that flooded over on me, too, when he came here to my home. He knew, and, and I mean that in a, a, on, he knew how to treat me. A lot of people dealing with Mr. Rogers, they were interested in Mr. Rogers, but they were not interested in me, very frankly. It was quite a while before my ability as a singer, and then they, when they saw how Fred behaved with me, some of them took a second look and said, oh, who is this man that is with Mr. Rogers? And uh, there were several things like that that happened, and people took a second look, a second judgment, and I began to feel as though they were treating me as a whole person. Francois Clemens was somebody, and not just an appendage who came in and did a few lines and left. Um, all of us contributed to the, the full fullness of that program. And now, thanks to, again to Morgan, I feel it's being acknowledged. What People was, are taking Absolutely. Mm-hmm. What was it like to to tell those stories again, to bring up all those memories for you? What were the emotions you were feeling telling those stories from those days? Well, sometimes they were sad. Sometimes they were sad. Sometimes they were not. Um, You read the book, and there's some scenes I can tell you that happened in Cincinnati. That I mean, if if Fred weren't, you know, a strong man Mm -hmm. standing there supporting me, I don't know what I would have done because the guy there wouldn't conduct. He said, get out, get out of the theater. We don't want any in the N-word. We don't want you here. Nobody else on the program had somebody say such a horrible, right. aggressively negative thing to them. They came and they did their job and they went home. But here I was, and he, he, he focused, he told me to get off the stage. Well, I was ready to go get my coat and fly back to New York. I said, I've been thrown out of worse places than this. I'm not staying here. Well, then Fred walks in the door, and um, you know, just mentioned, just mention, what's going on? What's going on? And, uh, we managed to tell him, Johnny and, and Betty and myself and uh, David Newell, tell him the story. And then uh, Fred insists that we go back upstairs to where the orchestra is. They're literally still on stage. All of this happened while the orchestra was warming up on stage. Wow. And traditionally, when we would go out, because of my musical background, I always started the rehearsals. And there was nothing, no you know, gimmick or anything about it. I was just ready. I woke up ready (laughs) and my voice. So I usually did my stuff first and nobody in the group objected whatsoever. But this conductor, so Fred goes upstairs and of course the conductor sees Fred and he's pawing all over. Oh, Mr. Rogers. Oh, we're so happy. Fred never said a word. He stood there. And after the big calm down, they saw that something was wrong. And he simply said to them, this is Francois Clemens. He plays Officer Clemens on our program. He travels with us. He sings. He has a beautiful voice. We love him. What did you say to him this morning? What did you feel you had to say to Mr. Officer Clemens? Well, the conductor was mortified because he was a racist, essentially. And the idea that Mr. Rogers was reprimanding him because I asked for common courtesy. I didn't want anything special. I had a role to do. Get out of the way and let me do my part. But he wouldn't let the orchestra. He told me to get off of his stage. Well, we stood there. And he, he stammered and stuttered and said some things. And Fred said, I think you owe him an apology. We do not talk to him like that. And we are not going to get accustomed to it with you. If you feel you cannot apologize, 
We understand. No one is going to force you to do what you cannot do. But we are going to pack up our stuff and go home. Next move is up to you. Wow. Well, he, he began to grovel, and he carried on. He touched me, and I, I, you know, in his lousy effort to make up for being an absolute brute. Mm. And I didn't want him to touch me, but there was Fred saying, here's the, you know, the, the, the peace offering. We must accept whatever he, however he extends it. I want to pop him in his mouth. <laughs> I'm not, Fred was the nice one. Right. Not me. <laughs> no, because I had learned how to survive. Sure. It wasn't quite the way he had learned. So there I was, and I said, okay, I accept your apology. But uh, I think you should be very careful in the future how you speak to everybody, not just black people or white people, but any person that you meet. You don't know who they are. And because Fred was there, and the, and the ensemble, Lady Aberlin and Mr. McKee, they were very, very supportive, Johnny Costa. We moved right on through it. And I tried to put this guy out of my, out of my head. That was a very, very powerful negative experience. It had its good side, of course. Sure. I ran into stuff like that in the in uh, uh, in the business. Um, there were times I, I write about it a little bit in the book when PBS, you know, was not always in New York or Chicago right. or Los Angeles in these very urban settings where everybody could get it. It was really uh, an educational station on these college campuses. And a lot of times the college campuses were not available to black people, minorities. And so they weren't watching Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. So both sides were doing their, their business. And one day I said to Fred, you know, how about if I do a tour around America and share with people what a wonderful, wonderful program I think this is? What a wonderful outreach I think they're doing. And that it's not about color. It's really, really about humanity, our humanity, our relationship to one another, the health of our children. And he said he thought that was a damn good idea. <laughs> so he said, write me a page, Francois. You just give me a page analysis of what you're doing, what you want to do. And I did. And I went on about an eight, nine-month tour of America. People don't know about this. I wrote about it in my book. And I went to black churches, black community centers. I went to uh, daycare centers. I went to concert halls. I sang everywhere. I sang his songs and I sang spirituals. So that, and then I did something that I'm, I'm very seldom proud of a certain kind of cleverness that I have. Okay. But I bought about 5,000 postcards. <laughs> And I gave them to those ladies and those guys running those daycare centers. And I said, would you please send this to Mr. Rogers and tell him what a nice time you had, how gracious our experience together, and perhaps even tell him you might watch the show again in the future. Well, they turned that into such a wonderful project. <laughs> All the kids drew pictures uh, of me and Mr. Rogers and Mr. McFeely. They, it was, you know, they turned it, sure. the daycare center turned it into such uh, uh, a um, uh, an experience, and they sent the pictures to Fred. And when I would go to, the, I said, "Where are those?" Because I'd look at the pictures, and there was a black person in the pictures. Uh -huh. Now, yeah, oh. it was me. Yes, they, they, the kids, because I was going to black uh, daycare centers, and their teachers were saying, "You know, Mr. Clemens is black, Mr. Rogers is white." That's all. So here's a crayon. Here are some crayons we can put together and see if we can draw him as a black person. Wow. The kids see age. They see color. They just don't see it negatively. Sure. They Absolutely. So we got busy and uh, those those postcards, those letters, those packets, those uh, 11 by, what is it, a 9 by 11, 8 by 11 packets began to come into the station with um, uh, uh, th projects that the schools had done all over the country. I think that helped to turn uh, the tide as far as black people being aware of Mr. Rogers and watching the program. Uh, we did that three years in a row. I had a wonderful accompanist travel with me. And you see, black people frequently are very spontaneous. And we uh, the fact that I could sing in church, sing Precious Lord, sing um, whatever it was, you know, that was, was going on. They love that. So you, you win the teachers over. Right. And then I could sing 
all the other songs that were children's songs, and Mr. Rogers' songs, of course, all of them. Uh, the kids, it was a huge success. So he said, let's do it next year, Francois. Let's get, you know, get uh, the, the publicity company that handled it, the promotion, all that stuff, and we did it a second time. And darn it, I'll be, we had a, just the most wonderful success, and we finally did it the third time. After that, I felt we had really, really turned a tide in terms of the general public because we went to every major city, Memphis, Nashville, Knoxville, uh, um, Atlanta, Birmingham, Montgomery, everywhere. <laughs> we were going and do, going through this same process of uh, trying to get the community to wake up and be aware of what this man was doing. And uh, in my opinion, it was worth it. Oh, I, I don't think there's any question. Because <laughs> you had an effect on me. There's, there's no question about it. I, I cannot thank you enough for being on this show today. It has been an absolute pleasure for me. And to hear well, these stories. Uh, uh, thank you very much. I, I want to ask you, if you don't mind, as we finish off today, could you sing oh, no. sing a little bit, sing us off today? <laughs> with your with your uh, favorite song from, from, the, from the show. Uh... You know, uh, I, I don't mind, first of all, okay. singing something from the show. What I want to say was one of the issues that I've uh, been traveling around the country discussing is the fact that I was an openly gay person. It took a while for that to come out uh, because Fred Rogers asked me not to come out publicly because the, he didn't feel uh, the, the promoters like Heinz, Heinz uh, 57 and Johnson and & Johnson and some of the companies would support an openly gay person on a children's television program. I didn't have to change. I just could not be openly gay by that having a relationship or saying certain things. And I respected that and I honored it. And so for 20 to 25 years, I never ever let on. I kept a low profile publicly so that I didn't want people to have something for their scandal sheets or to be cheap. Uh, first of all, because who I am, and secondly, because who, what the program was about. Sure. It wasn't about something cheap like that. And I, I didn't want any hint of scandal. So I just simply put that away for some 20-something years. And, I, and once again, I do write about that in my book because the thing that I probably miss most about my youth growing up in Youngstown, born, I was born in the South, is that I didn't have what I would consider a role model, a healthy good role model. And uh, that's what I propose to the kids as I travel. Not to tell someone you, you should be this or you should not be that. Simply that I'm here. I happen to be a gay person. Uh, and I, a lot of my mail I get comes from trans and from gay boys and from lesbian women who say, my life has been totally different now that I realize the relationship that you're gay and the relationship you have with Mr. Rogers, and that he loved you. I, I'm Very so important. I'm so glad that you brought that up because it really is important. Um, you know, uh, uh, our audience. We have a lot of our audience is is younger, mm -hmm. and they don't understand that because back in that time, you didn't talk <laughs> about it. These days, we can talk about it, but we didn't. And so, I'm so glad you you mentioned that. Well, I just thought uh, it would be an important. Thing for people to know about me because it is who I am sure and I'm very comfortable uh, uh, that uh, that's who I am I've grown and I've changed and I'm very grateful that I, I'm still alive while I can be myself it was um, it was not easy so to speak being in the closet uh, all those years so I consider it a sacrifice but it was well worth it uh, when I read about some of the other great musicians and artists and painters and dancers and directors who had to stay in the closet, I feel very sad for us because it means you don't have a certain kind of fulfilled life. Right, it's, you can't be yourself. No, you cannot. And they're asking you to make an almost an ultimate sacrifice. Um, it's, it's a real challenge. Well, By the way, I just uh, uh, and almost all of the reviews that talk about the book they add that element. There was one just came out yesterday about in one of the gay uh, publications, National, yes. where they were saying uh, how well it's handled and it's honest and they're glad. They're very happy. And so many, many people where I go 
say, let's talk about that, please. We will, we've been wanting to talk, discuss that. I've also done Skype for Florida, for Texas, for uh, uh, Ohio, uh, where else? <laughs> A number of places where I've actually had class right here in my office. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, we will sit, we will put the link out so that everyone can okay. go find your book, and I'm going to go get it and read it. I can't wait to read right. your book. So if you don't mind, do you mind singing us out today? No. It's, uh, uh, let's see. Uh, you, and you, you wanted a Mr. Rogers song. Yes, just for for my, for my for my before you came, I practice a um, a spiritual. Well, we can we can do um, the spiritual also. <laughs> I just love listening to your voice. Oh, aren't you nice? He's got the whole world in his hand. He's got the whole round of world right in his hand. He's got the whole world right in his hand. He's got the whole world in his hand. He's got the sun and the moon, Lord, in his hand. He's got the sun and the moon, Lord, in his hand. He's got the sun and the moon, Lord, in his hand. He's got the whole world in his hand. He's got the going and the coming, y'all. In his hand, he's got the going and the coming right up. In his hand, he's got the going and the coming right up. In his hand, he's got the whole world in his hand. He's got you and me right up. In his hand, he's got you, Lord, me right up. In his hand, he's got you and me right up. In his hand. He's got the whole world in his hand. <laughs> what an absolute pleasure. Thank well, you so much, Francois. <laughs> I'm glad you enjoyed it, and thank you for asking me. Oh, it's been such a pleasure. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>